Here's an introduction to stellar spectra to accompany chapter 17 of the textbook Astronomy from OpenStax. So why do we care about stellar spectra? You, you probably remember from the introduction to spectra lecture that the absorption lines that you would see in a star are going to tell you about the composition. So the existence of given spectral lines are due to light being absorbed by an atom, exciting a particular atomic transition. And so if you see that line, you know that that atom must be in that star. And to some extent, the, the strength of that line or how deep it is, is going to tell you how much you have of that element. But that's often not the main reason we care about spectra. So if we look at some stars of different ages uh, in, in the Milky Way, this is for our purposes a random selection. Um, what we're looking at here is the iron content on the vertical axis. And you can see that they're all in a relatively tight grouping here. The axis scale is a little bit confusing. It's a logarithm of a ratio. Um, all you need to know is this is within a factor of a few here. So they're, they're all pretty similar in terms of composition. Um, and this has to do with the element formation, uh, the, the history of element formation in our universe that we're not going to talk about more in this particular lecture. So though a lot of stars have similar composition, the spectra are still very valuable, as we'll, we'll go over here in a few moments, uh, giving other information. So especially the temperature of the star, we can get information on the radius, and also on the motion. I do want to mention that all stars are not exactly the same composition. Some have uh, extremely different uh, elemental abundances. So for instance, if you look at the europium content versus the iron content, um, you know, stars in the disk of our <clears throat> Milky Way are all very, very similar, but you see some halo stars that have very enriched europium. Things like these, um, composition differences like these are very important in terms of understanding the history of element formation in our universe. So let's move on from composition and look at other things that we can learn uh, from stellar spectra. So if you haven't, uh, if you don't remember it, go back and look at the introduction to spectra lecture, and you will remember then that the amount of ionization that you have or the amount of excitation that you have is going to depend on the stellar temperature. So if I take uh, a given atom, let's say for instance uh, calcium, and I look at the fraction of this calcium that is in a particular uh, excited state versus temperature, I can see that that increases with temperature. And similarly, if I take a look at uh, hydrogen, um, it's also gonna, gonna change. The amount of hydrogen that's either you know, in an excited state or even ionized is gonna depend sensitively on temperature. We discussed that in more detail in that lecture. Um, and so we not only have this for individual atoms, but we can also just see this for groupings of kind of various metals. So because the amount of ionization and excitation depends on the temperature, then we can look at this strength of different atomic and molecular absorption lines, and that is going to tell us about the temperature of the star. So the vertical axis on this plot, this is the relative strength of that absorption line. So, so basically how significant is it? You'd think of it as the kind of the depth and width combined. And we can plot that as a function of temperature where we're cooling off as we go to the right. You see lines from a lot of molecules at the lowest temperatures, uh, metals at these kind of intermediate temperatures, and then hydrogen and finally helium as you go to higher temperatures. So you can then say, let's take a given star, let's look at how many neutral helium lines I have. If I have a lot of those and very few metal lines, okay, that's a really hot star. If I see lines from molecules, then that means, okay, that's a really cold star. And so you can use these spectra then to determine your temperature and uh, therefore the spectral type or the spectral class. You'll notice these spectral classes, these go as O, B, A, F, G, K, M. I think of it as O, B, F, G, K, M. There are a bunch of silly mnemonics out there you can look at to, to memorize this order. Um, but this is the order from high temperature down to low temperature. The reason that they're all jumbled up is when people were first classifying stars they didn't know what the spectral features had to do with. Um, they just knew they were different. And some of the stars were similar. Those were in class A. 
there was another type of set of stars that, that was similar to each other, but not to class A, that was B, and, and so on. And we're left finally with, okay, these particular spectral features then correspond to this, this temperature sequence, and that's why that's that way. Just for some examples of actual stars here, uh, we have our OBAF GKM. These are spectra from actual stars, and you, you can see for the very hot stars, there are very few absorption uh, features. You have very few spectral lines, and they're, they're not very deep. And as you go then to lower temperatures, you're able, for instance, to have a lot of lines from metals, like our sun, which is a G star. Um, this isn't the sun, but this is a G star. And then as you go to the coolest stars, um, the M-type, uh, here you have extremely strong absorption lines, and uh, these are due to molecules. Now, I slipped a little bit there when I called this the coolest type. This used to be the coolest type until somewhat recently, when it was realized we actually need to, to add more letters to this classification. And so somewhat recently, within the past decade or so, um, there's been spectral classes added, L, T, and Y, and it's the same idea, you're just moving even cooler. So your M class gets you to this uh, temperature, you know, of uh, around 3000 Kelvin, and then if you wanna go cooler, you can go L, T, and, and Y. Um, now, the L, T, and Y, calling these stars is, is true, there are stars, but one thing you wanna note is these are actually brown dwarfs. So a um, star like our sun has hydrogen being burned into helium in the core. However, you can have objects where it's hot enough in the core to fuse deuterium, which is very easy to burn, but not hydrogen. So there's still thermonuclear burning in the core, um, but it's of deuterium and not, and not hydrogen. And that's what's called a, a brown dwarf. And um, that brings you into these L, T, and Y classes. And the reason that Jupiter is shown here is brown dwarfs are very close to being really just giant gas planets. So the, the, the main difference between a giant gaseous planet like Jupiter and a brown dwarf like these stars pictured here is that you can have deuterium burning in the core of these stars and Jupiter is just a little bit too cool to, to do that. So spectra are also useful in determining stellar radii. So here what you're looking at is the width of a spectral line. So while the location of a spectral line um, in terms of the, the wavelength tells you which atom that you have and that the depth of that line will tell you how much you have, the width provides uh, extra information. So for instance, we can compare to two stars here. Um, we have this gray spectrum and this black one and the inset uh, zooms in on a particular spectral line and you can see that the gray that spectral line is quite a bit narrower than for the darker kind of black or, or dark gray right so it's the same spectral line for both of them but one is broader so so what causes this is the pressure in the atmosphere of these stars okay and so how is that linked to the radius? Well, if your atom is closer to the rest of the star, so it's sort of closer into kind of the center, you're gonna have a lot more collisions, right? There's more atoms and molecules around, you're gonna be banging around and colliding, that's gonna change the velocity, um, and that's gonna cause a lot of Doppler broadening that we talked about in the introduction to redshift lecture. And so you're gonna have a broader spectral line. That means you're closer to the rest of the star. If instead your atom is further from the rest of the star, you're sort of puffy way out there in a distant envelope, there are gonna be fewer atoms and molecules around, you're gonna have fewer collisions, there's gonna be less opportunity for Doppler broadening, and you're gonna have narrower spectral lines. And that's one way we can tell when we look at these two spectra then, the gray one is a narrow line, so that means those atoms are very far away from the star. The dark gray or the black these are wider, you're closer to the star. And so we know that the light gray, this is a giant star. This is a star whose envelope, uh, or the photosphere that we actually see, is very far from the rest of the, from the center. Whereas the dark gray or the black, 
this is a more ordinary star like our sun. So there the photosphere is closer to the center of the star. It's a smaller radius object. And so there's a lot more collisional broadening. And that's one way then you can get radius constraints from spectra, which is pretty cool. Now, finally, you can also get information on the motion. Uh, I won't go into this in detail because we talked about this in the introduction to redshift lecture, but you can get the information on the radial velocity of a star. So the Doppler broadening, as we talked about in that lecture, tells you how fast a star is moving uh, away from us or towards us. Uh, you don't get information about its absolute motion in space. Um, that The only way to get that is to combine it with information like parallax, and so you get the transverse velocity uh, by many measurements over time, and then you can get you know, the proper motion. But, but in any case, the, the spectrum, the Doppler shift, this is key to giving you the radial velocity. And as we also discussed in the introduction to redshift lecture, uh, the broadening of the spectral lines can give you information about the rotation rate. So if one part of the star is sort of rotating towards you, that's going to be a blue shifted spectral line. One rotates away, that's red shifted. And the faster the star is rotating, you know, you're going to have a stronger red shift on one side and a stronger blue shift on the other. When you look at the star, you see the whole thing at once. And so um, it, instead of having, you know, spectral lines that are blue shifted from one side and red from the other, instead you have this broad smeared out thing. And the more smeared out it is, um, the faster the rotation rate would be. And you might say, wait a second, how do you, you just said pressure would distinguish it or would uh, broaden the line. How do you distinguish between broadening from rotation and pressure? And th that gets down to the details of how exactly you change the width of it, how exactly it changes the shape. And that's you know beyond our introduction to, um, to stellar spectra here. And that is it for this introduction to stellar spectra for Astronomy 1000.